Hey, what up, players? It's Warboss Tay up in this mug. Welcome to part two of how to paint these Kador Warjacks for War Machine and the Kador Army. Let's look at the paints we're going to be using today to finish our War Machines up. We've got Mephiston Red, Evil Sun Scarlet, Wild Rider Red, and I think we're also, yeah, Troll Slayer Orange. We're getting, we're going from the reds to the oranges. You could see that on the armor plates there. And um, other than that, the other colors you already have, we're, we will just be using them to clean up if we do any paint over spills like Lead Belcher, Balthazar Gold, etc. But this is what they look like. We're just working on the highlights, highlighting our models back up from where we left them off at the end of the first video. So if you would like to hear the tutorial music, thumbs up, then click on the link in the description and it'll take you to the special video I made with all the tutorial music on it. Here's what your model would look like after we start painting back up with Mephiston Red. What I did was I painted Mephiston Red over the plates that had been darkened with the shades. You can kind of see I didn't hit the um, fists yet, but in between the videos I kind of highlighted back up the armor plates but leaving some, some um, darkened areas. I, I did record that, but unfortunately uh, the video was all it was like the majority of it as I was narrating it, I realized, oh my god, it's all, it is all out of focus the whole time. So I'm just going back and I'm redoing it and I'm showing you the technique I used. For that first bottom plate, I used a horizontal breaststroke. And for this one that goes kind of sloping up over his back, because it's more vertical, I guess it's longer, I'm kind of going from a front to back. So you, you can kind of do it on your own, figure out which style you want to go with vertical breaststrokes or horizontal breaststrokes as long as you keep your paint thin down and you also um, be consistent with your paint and you don't have to use too much as you can see as soon as I put it on the model it kind of just sits there and then you have to really go back and blend it using the the, the paintbrush And uh, again, if you haven't been watching my videos, I'm a huge fan of the Rosemary and Company brushes that I've been using recently. I'm um, still only used to using just two of them, but I'm I'm trying to work my way through using all of them so I can do a good a good review on their products. But definitely check them out, Rosemary and Company. Beautiful, beautiful brushes, very very easy to handle and uh, worth every penny. I think. And for a guy like me, you know, who has all his life just used like Games Workshop Citadel brushes, and I've used a couple army painter brushes now that I think about it, it's um, it's a it's a pretty big thing to say. I think this is the brush that I'm going to use for the rest of my life. <laughs> if I ever have to hand brush, uh, this is the brush that I want to be using. Okay, so enough about that. Let's talk about um, my theory. I, it's always good to have a theory, you know, when you're going into paint a model and uh, my theory with the color is that I'm gonna go a little bit brighter than I am with or than I did with my Man of War Shock Troopers. Those uh, Man of War Cinerators they did not get the eventual orange highlights that these guys are gonna get and when I was thinking of why I want to go that high and that extreme with the highlights I thought uh, you know these guys are gonna be really big on the field they're probably when the uh, client puts down this army, these guys are going to be the ones that the opponent first really takes a look at because they're such big, impressive, imposing models. The strength of the Manowar Shock Troopers unit is that they are all completely uniform. They look really clean, their um, colors are really smooth, and uh, that's what makes those guys look good because the red looks very, very realistic and true. And I thought, okay, when we're, when I'm painting up this guy, I could, I could kind of do the same thing. But because the armor plates are so large and because the model is of a bigger scale, I want the opponent to be able to see right from across the field where those lines are and how the light will hit those armor plates. So uh, that's why I wanted to create the um the optical illusion of the the light hitting the edges and creating those hard highlights and um whereas with the man of war shock troopers the fact that they are all a very uniform red is what is the most striking thing so um when, when you're going to paint any model i think you have to decide from the very beginning what is the finished product going to look like how how do i want the model to look on the table do i want it to be bright 
and um, do I want the colors to really stand out and pop and do I want each of the details or certain details to be um, very much brought to the forefront or do I want a very gritty and uh, very uh, muddied and dirty look. I think the thing that is one of the strengths of the Blanchitsu, the John Blanch miniatures featured in White Dwarf Visions is that they are so uh, gritty and weathered and odd looking. They, they look just like his paintings come to life. There are checker patterns and um, very precise details like the freehand, but overall the weathering and the sepia washes, um, they make them look very, very much like one of John Blanche's artwork from the 80s and 90s. On the other hand, when you look at the Evy Metal team, you will see that their lines are very, very clean and distinct. When the um, Skaven, the new Rat Ogres came out, uh, they're not even Rat Ogres, they're like those giant Skaven Terminator Rat Ogres. Uh, when those came out, I thought the, the Evy Metal team did a great job of highlighting and edge highlighting the uh, armor for the Skaven, the, those rat ogre things, because they're um, the rat ogres themselves are a very pale pink kind of fleshy color for the skin. But then their armor, um, some of it was like turquoise for some reason, and some of it was red. And uh, it's just such a weird thing, you know. The sculpt is so weird. The concept of giant mutated rat ogre creatures having uh, having armor, plates of armor riveted to their bodies. So that's why I decided to be able to um, paint these guys so that you can really pick out where those plates begin and where they end. So not only do you get a very bright, clean, colorful, uh, cartoony paint job, but uh, you also get a good edge highlight. Um, for, for these paint jobs, I decided that I wanted the effect of the models to be like they have seen action and they are not uh, fresh off the factory line, but that they are constantly being repainted, repaired, and refurbished so that um, they are veterans of, of, of the field and uh, they've seen action, but again, they are taken care of so well that the, the paint is always bright, it's always clean, any chips and dents get hammered out. Um, even, even then though, with a machine that you continue to maintain and take care of, you do see a little bit of that wear and tear underneath, even though there are no obvious dents and chips or scratches. So uh, it's a different technique than I've seen a lot of people highly weathering and, and chipping their, their Kador Warjacks. I've seen some um, a lot of great examples online. If you go to the War Machine Tactics webpage, which I think is warmachinetactics.com, you'll see a lot of fantastic art uh, concept art of um, artist renditions of the uh, models as if they were real, you know, um, creatures and, and people and stuff. And they look really great, except that there is a lot of weathering and there is a lot of uh, lead belcher. It, it looks like they you dry brush a lot of lead belcher and silver on the edges where you would get the most wear and tear. And I thought, okay, for, for my guys, we're not gonna go down that route. We're going to make them look a little bit more clean and um, like they just came out of being repainted and having all the dents banged out. And I think that's um, what, what would please this customer, this particular customer. But it also creates a very cool aesthetic that um, it doesn't look like your models are you know dirty and and grimy and at the same time it doesn't look like they're completely new and fresh to the battle and again that's just keeping in mind what is the final effect that you want the way we do that or the way that i'm doing that is i'm going to be building up these colors especially when we get to evil sun scarlet and i'm going to be painting the edges of the armor and the, the center of the big armor plates and leaving those shadows dark. If you feel like you're painting in the shadows too much, like take a look at that left gauntlet right there. You see that the wash is dried on it, it looks really dark and when I'm building the color back up, I want that color to appear on the flat areas, on the largest areas of the model of that, that, that power fist. But I do want to um, retain that dark shadow in the corners. 
and in the edges and in the shadows or crevices rather. So uh, this is something you get with practice, just continuing to blend and figure out for yourself where do you put shadow on a model, you know? Where do you put the highlights on a model? If I'm just looking at the model without picking it up, if I never pick it up and I just look at it on the table, then the shadows are going to always kind of remain in the same place. If I pick up a model, start turning it in my hand, all of a sudden those shadows move and they change and um, you're going to find yourself having to uh, decide, do you, do you want that or do you want to have a consistent shade always in the same area so that um, you just hope that most people will see it from that angle? Or do you want to paint it so that the shadows are overall generally in the sh in uh, the darkest areas, in the cracks and the crevices, even if you pick it up, um, you maintain that kind of optical illusion that those shadows are always there. So here I've chosen to go with the vertical paint stroke on these gauntlets because the armor plates are very big going from the um, top of the hand all the way to the bottom. So uh, I could have gone from knuckle to elbow, kind of like a more of a, at a more horizontal uh, paint stroke, but I've decided to go from top to bottom, from thumb to pinky rather. And over here when we get to the, I guess kind of where the spikes in the knuckles are, that's where I'm kind of edging it a little bit more. So it's always good to change up your brush strokes. Um, I think once you lay on your colors, you want a nice smooth kind of application. You don't want, you don't want your viewer, the person you're showing off your model to. You don't want them to see the actual brush strokes. You want to blend in your paint so that it covers really smoothly. That's why a lot of people use airbrushes because the application and the blend is so nice and so smooth. Um, but there is something to be said about hand brushing using the paintbrush like this and uh, what a lot of new painters think they want is to slap on each layer of paint and completely cover what you did before when a lot of times what we want to see is a transition of the colors and a blending of the colors. The uh, best technique that I can think of for doing that is called feathering and or it's what I call feathering and might be different from what other uh, painters call feathering but basically it's taking a tiny bit of the paint you don't want to have like a giant glob of paint on your on your paintbrush you want to just take a little bit of paint thin it down on your wet palette and then when you apply it to the model especially on these larger armor plates if you watch me do this application here I'm um, putting the paint down with the initial brush strokes and then I am kind of uh, um, I guess feathering or spreading the paint out with uh, very short and quick strokes of the paintbrush and this blends the paint so that it um, spreads out over the surface that you're painting and it really helps when you have larger surface areas. If you're going with really small details and um, stuff like that then it's not going to work as well. You can still do it, it's going to be a lot more precise though. If you want to practice this method then definitely find yourself a model that has lots of large surface areas like this guy. And you can tell that I'm going back over a lot of areas. And this is because if you want to get the best color transition, the um, recommended thing is to do a couple of applications, a couple of coats. So sometimes I just do one coat and I think it's, you know, it's going to be fine. But uh, in between videos, when you see these videos hard cut like that, I'm really just going back over and I'm applying one, two more coats. Okay, yeah, so we are actually going and hitting the model up with Lead Belcher. And uh, I think I might have not mentioned that color in the opening of the video. And that's because um, I, I missed some of these details, like the rivet there in in uh, the, the guy's power fist. Uh, some, some of these areas got a little bit of shade on them 
and um, the shade dried and we want to bring that metallic shine back up. So I had a lot of fun painting these guys. You know, um, I've always, I've, I've been painting since 2009 and I think I've always stuck with Games Workshop and uh, I've been, a, I don't want to say a fanboy, but I've really been a very strong um, supporter of their aesthetic, especially their fantasy line. And um, I just really, really enjoyed that kind of token Middle Earth kind of aesthetic. Uh, I didn't care for the, the Lord of the Rings models as much, but I really, really liked the, the low fantasy and the, the grim, dark world of uh, Warhammer Fantasy, the old world. And uh, then I got into 40K. And then when I decided to start up my own commission painting business, I thought, you know, I'm going to just try to be proficient in as many kinds of techniques and uh, as, as large of a range as possible with these models. So uh, when I took on this this War Machine commission, I thought, okay, this is finally my way of diving into this this aesthetic, the steampunk, big, clunky, um, almost anime style, I want to say. Like, look how just top-heavy... Um, this guy kind of reminds me of Metal, Metal Slug. Is that what it's called? Uh, just big, cartoony, Popeye-looking robots and... Um, you know, I, I never thought that I would be interested in them. I always thought, oh, they look too out of this world and uh, like, like too much of a mixture between fantasy and 40k and stuff. But it's its own thing. And, you know, when, you're, when you uh, want to broaden your, your skills uh, or strengthen your skills, broaden your range of experience with as many different models as possible, then um, I think you should never shy away from a challenge. So I am actually really, really pleased with how these guys came out. Um, the the aesthetic of the steampunk kind of big cartoony robot, I actually started to take to it after painting the Cinerators. And um, once I got into these Heavy Jacks, boy, I really just, the time flew by. I enjoyed my time with it. I thought, um, you know, I, I really have been missing out because I haven't been painting these kinds of models and uh yeah i'd love to paint some more so that's just a little plug for my studio it's war boss tay studios if uh, you haven't seen any of my videos before you can see my website warbostaystudios.com that's all one word warbostaystudios.com and you can email me if you would like to get a quote on a project for you that's warbostaystudios at gmail.com most of my stuff like i said has been games workshop but uh, this is a new direction for me. I don't know, you know, not many people have uh, commented on these War Machine videos. I'm gonna kind of change it up. There's a bunch of other things and commissions that I'm working on, but uh, I thought let's let's get this War Machine starter, this two, two person, two player starter box, um, all these videos out at the same time in case anybody's interested. But I think uh, my usual <laughs> audience is, um, uh, watches my videos for for fantasy and 40k stuff so i'm gonna just change it up uh you know i'm always into getting into new models as well so or new ranges and different publishers and or manufacturers rather so uh yeah I'm, we're, I'm looking at doing some some different things after this moving on to wild rider red this is the uh first step away from the bright red and actually stepping into um orange territory here so what i'm starting to do is i'm i'm looking for the edges of all of these armor plates and i am going to be painting them i'm going to be painting the rivets i decided in the end you know i was looking at a bunch of different artists take on the rivet colors do you make them silver do you keep them red and i decided i'm going to keep them red but i'm going to highlight them to the bright orange of the edge highlighting of the armor plates. And what this is going to do is it's not going to create such a jarring look when you are looking at the model, but you are going to be able to see the individual rivets. You are going to be able to see all of the individual rivets on the model. Do you see how just how great these rosemary brushes are at, at edge highlighting? Usually what I would have to do is get a little bit of paint on the edge of my brush and go at it from an angle but um yeah these rosemary brushes really they hold their tips so well that i can 
literally paint it along the edge of the armor plate and uh, and and not have to worry about it. If if you are not so confident of your uh, brush skills, then what you could do is, like I said, turn it at an angle so that you're kind of going with the flat of your brush, and then thin down your paint so that it's on your brush, but it's not uh, sitting at the end like a big glob of paint, and then drag the flat of your brush rather than the tip. Uh, go at it kind of like perpendicular and drag the flat end of your brush along the hard edge. That's called edge highlighting. You see it a lot on Space Marines for Warhammer 40k. Um, any Anywhere where you've got lots of big flat edges, vehicles, armor, um, large machines in, in miniature wargaming, especially like Fantasy 40k, that kind of stuff, you're going to see a lot of edge highlighting because uh, it, it makes the models look good. It, it looks like there's light picking up off the edge of the model, off the edge of all that metal, and um, that's what that's what people like to look at. So there's more, there's some really, really great advanced techniques out there. I just purchased a book called Masterclass Volume 1 with Angel Giraldez and um, I've, I've been reading it, and he talks a lot about points of light, highlighting, and um, creating artificial points of light with your highlighting on models. And it's uh, really, really good stuff, unfortunately, because I'm still pretty new at uh, airbrushing. I'm, um, I'm still getting my head wrapped around some of his blending techniques. But um, the, more, the more confident I get at, at the airbrushing, the more... Uh, I'll, I'll definitely be able to share with all of you, especially other fellow beginners at airbrushes like me, how to achieve good solid effects with your airbrush. I keep thinking about my recent Dark Eldar Venom commission and just how much fun I had doing that. Uh, that was a, a great, great job to take. I mean, I, I'm not like just patting myself on the back like, great, great job, Tay. I'm actually saying that was a great opportunity for me to uh, strengthen my skills. And hey, uh, it is September 17th, and that means that we still have half a month to go before uh, October begins, and that means Spookytoberfest. So uh, stay tuned for that. Let me talk a little bit about this and then we'll get back to Spookytoberfest. I've uh, continued to edge highlight all of the armor plates. The um, the ones by the, the crotch area and over the upper area of the legs are a little bit tricky because of the mold lines. The ones by the feet, you could tell, are, are a lot more easy to paint because they have a very... Sorry, Duke is walking around on all the plastic bags. Um, they have a very soft curve, so you can create some really interesting effects if you just feather your paint. You, the, the trick with feathering is, especially when you're edge highlighting, you don't want a lot of paint on your brush. I think that's one of the, the best pieces of advice I can give with any kind of painting, especially with highlighting and feathering. Thin your paint, and uh, if like ideally on a wet palette, but yeah, thin your paint and then use less than you need and just gently work it along the, the curve of whatever you're going to paint. And here we're going with the gun arm. You might see that um, because the juggernaut and I always forget what the other one is called, these two heavy jacks, I always, between clips, I'm jumping back and forth because the techniques apply pretty much to both of them. It's just there are very specific, or not specific, but there, there are different kinds of um, techniques that you're going to be using depending on if you're painting on this guy with a cannon arm or the other guy who's basically got a, a big power fist <laughs> which is identical to this the fist with the with the axe in it but without the axe I'm also um, I'm also going to school full time. I, I might have mentioned that before. Some of you already know that, so 
that's taking up uh, most of my time, but I'm pretty much painting full time with this commission studio, spending most of my days working kind of like I'm trying to keep the same hours as I would if I had a full time job. And it's for those of you who paint as a hobby, like I used to do for, you know, the past five years before I started this commission painting business, it's um, it's a little bit of a different animal when you're painting for clients because all of a sudden you have uh, deadlines, even though they're not going to be super strict deadlines unless you tout yourself as being able to paint, you know, an army in two weeks or something like that. Uh, you're working for a customer who's not yourself. So whereas normally if I was starting a project and I decided, ah, you know what, I'm, I'm losing interest in this project or I'm not, I'm not able to get the effect that I want. So I'm kind of losing my motivation. Um, setting deadlines is a great way to to stick to a, a project until it's complete. And hey, if you have not yet joined Idic Beer's Get It Painted uh, challenge, that is a fantastic way to go. I still have yet to film my first Get It Painted video for Idic Beer, but um, I am going to. I've chosen a really really cool project that I'm I'm going to start and get done. All right, here we go. Presto changeo. All of a sudden, our heavy warjack has a power fist instead of a cannon arm. And I'm showing you how I did this guy up to the point of my last warjack. I did all of the Wild Rider red. So you can see, like, look how nice we, we're already looking at all of the uh, highlights. And you can see them when you're turning the model around. It looks really nice. So now we're getting to the final color, the pop color, as Nick likes to call it. And it is going to be Troll Slayer orange beautiful beautiful color and it is that uh this is the effect where we are not going to paint the entire edge of an armor plate we're going to find um small stretches of the armor plate where we want to build the color up and create points of light to uh, really pull the focus towards So, uh, as our most yellow orange color, this is going to be our final highlight. If you really want to go crazy, I've seen some painters who went all the way to yellow. And the trick of doing that is you don't want to just paint yellow on as a highlight. That is too crazy. It's too crazy to go up to like a flash gets yellow or an aerial yellow. Uh, what you have to do is paint the yellow on into the orange. So if I really wanted to build points of light, I would find the corners of these um, armor plates and I would just dot each corner with yellow or I'd paint a little strip of yellow down where the curve is most prominent like it's catching the light and creating a yellow glint but um, again that that is really more for display and I want these pieces to look good on the table and um, I don't want to have to worry about uh, distracting with with a with, with that glint of yellow color, so I I really think just going up to orange like this for for a for a good solid clean paint job is all you need to do because it shows that transition of color from that rich tomato cherry candy co candy colored red to um, that beautiful orange. It's not harsh on the eyes. It's um, it perfectly go perfectly goes up. Um, like if you think about the movie Tron or models that look like that, the the highlighting is so extreme and it looks good, but it is very, very um, glaring. And it's meant to look like that because it's, it creates a very contrast, contrasting look. Okay, I think I kind of jumped ahead. Um, but yeah, we're we're continuing on with the Troll Slayer Orange. Sometimes, you know, the uh, my camera will will cut a video if if it's going over twelve minutes, or if the memory card is full, it will just stop. <laughs> and it's quiet. This T five I is is quiet, so it doesn't let me know that it stopped recording. It's just like throws up its hand and it says, "I'm done. I'm not recording anymore." And then I'm meanwhile like painting and getting uh, lost in it and yeah. So sometimes I apologize if I miss anything. And I, I seem to be getting a little bit better at keeping models in frame and in focus. And I think these larger heavy jacks are, are better at that for some reason. 
um, yeah, with the smaller models, it gets really uh, iffy. Which is weird because I'm on the macro setting. I've got my ISO and my f-stop set at what I think are the optimal uh, recording specifications. But I don't know. What, what do you guys, if, if you record often tutorials or reviews or anything, um, what what are your settings? I'd I'd love to hear from from you guys. What what do you what do you paint? What what's your ISO at? What's your f-stop at? Um, obviously, I think you would use your your macro setting. That's the best one uh, to use, I think, because it's meant to really focus in on smaller objects. But yeah, I'd love to know. Let let me know in the comments. So we are reaching the end of this model and I think the final thing I'm going to want to do is paint the bases black. Besides uh, painting the bases black, one of the final steps that I'm going to need to be doing is spraying the model with a varnish. and. There are three types of varnish out there. You've got your gloss, your satin, and your matte. And uh, each of them are gonna give different results, different finishing looks. And uh, my favorite is the matte look, which means flat and uh, non-shiny. Gloss and satin varnishes are gonna give you a very uh, slick, shiny, almost candy-coated look. and uh, while that could be good for for some things, especially jewels, if you have jewels or gems on your models, a little bit of gloss varnish will look really good. Or if you've got, you know, eyeballs or uh, tongues and like, you know, lots of orcs or organic creatures like that, tyranids, their mouths are open and they're like, Rah! they're making <laughs> they're making that face, you know, and uh, gloss varnish in there to simulate like saliva and slime is is okay i guess but uh, generally i like to coat my models in matte varnish and i've always used tester's dull coat to me that's always really really good especially if you use tester's gloss coat or the gloss varnish that tester's sells you put that on first it makes your model really shiny and um glossy looking and then you use dull coat over that to dull down the shine i always thought that looked good now that I've got an airbrush, I have Vallejo's gloss, satin, and matte varnishes. So I'm going to be using those in combination, kind of the same way. Gloss first, or satin first maybe, just to create a nice hard shell so that if you drop the model, or if your finger rubs against it, because you're, you know, you're going to be using these things to play with, um, it won't chip the paint. But then to dull down that shine, I'll put the matte varnish. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I love, okay, so just as a disclaimer, you guys, I love painting. I love it. I love painting. I've always loved it. I've loved how, um, I guess when I was younger, I used to have a lot of anxiety. And I know a lot of people in our community kind of deal with anxiety and um, that kind of thing. And I've always found painting to be really relaxing. And now that I've got a business based around my abilities as a painter, and now that I'm really trying to engage the community and, uh, you know, start conversations with all of you and create, you know, long-standing relationships, because not only are you all my potential customers, but I want to, you know, be able to be a part of this community and have this community with you guys. Um, I've always thought that the painting side of it is just, for me, so personally therapeutic and soothing and uh, it's just so much fun to to pick up a brush and to forget about uh, everything and to just paint for a couple hours a day. So now that <laughs> those couple of hours have turned into work, um, my, my actual job, I'm, I'm really I'm really happy. I'm really enjoying my time. So if like I said, if you want to get a quote for a commission, please, by all means, get a hold of me. You can email me again, Studios, all one word, at gmail.com. And uh, just let me know what, what, what you want to do, and I will try to get you a, a quote that I feel is fair for, not only for you, the customer, to get a good price, but uh, 
Also, uh, for me as well as the artist, this is, you know, how I'm trying to make my living now. And um, a lot of people say, oh, commission painting is so expensive. Uh, well, that's because I don't do it as a hobby anymore. This is kind of like how I want to make my living. And as each job is, is personalized and individual, and I'm trying to uh, do my best in each and every single job, I want to foster that, that sense and that, um, that relationship. So, so uh, thank you guys for supporting me and uh, watching me just edge highlight this model. Um, I don't know why, but when I have to sit down and, and work, uh, if, I was, if I was you guys right now and I'm still watching this video, um, after a while, just doing the same thing over and over, repetition, even though it's great for, for painting, um, that's why we all love to listen to podcasts or music or have a TV, a movie going on in the background because uh, the repetition itself is is kind of killer. So thank you for bearing with me, putting up with me, watching me paint these two Kador Jacks. This is what they look like. All I did was paint the bases black. They're still a little wet, so that's why I'm I'm leaving them on uh, my, my cardboard here. But want to show them to you in all their glory before I take them out to be varnished. And I'm very, very happy with the way they came out. You don't have to paint them up this crazy if you don't want to. If you really want to just get a, a tabletop good paint job, just do the reds, spray your model red, paint the silver details, give it a wash, and then paint it back up with a nice red color like Mephiston Red. Thanks for watching, everybody. Hope you had a great time. We'll see you in the next video.